This week on Extracts, hideous boxes, peeping foxes, boy, these men are toxic. It's the Toxic Masculinity episode. Welcome to Extrax, a podcast where we introduce each other to our fandoms one episode at a time. I'm your host, Aaron Klein, an X-Files spooky bitch. And I'm your other host, Stella Cheeks, a slut for Star Trek The Original Series. Each podcast, we pick two episodes that fit a cinematic theme, watch them together, and then record our feelings. Our theme this week is toxic masculinity. Fun! <laughs> For this fun and casual theme, I chose the season three episode, Is There In Truth No Beauty? <laughs> I say it like that because I said it wrong for this whole like show prep. <laughs> Look, it's so weird phrasing. Dr. Jones just wants to be recognized for her considerable talent and skill as both a telepath and a psychologist and not pitied for her disability or undermined because of her beauty. Relatable. But oh, no, she is being followed around by one pitiful man that won't take no for an answer and has to put up with the triumvirate, undercutting her abilities while endlessly and annoyingly praising her beauty. No wonder she's so touchy. Sure, everything works out in the end, but damn, give this girl goddamn metal. No wonder she wants to move to a planet with incorporeal beings. This woman needs a forever break from the menace of men. Who doesn't? <laughs> <laughs> and this week we are jumping way, way forward from where we've been talking about the last few weeks, all the way to season 10, episode 3, and the return of Darren Morgan to the series with Mulder and Scully meet the Were Monster. I picked this one for this theme, literally only because of the brilliant monologue given by Reese Darby about what it's like to suddenly become a human man, including how he is compelled to lie about his sex life for literally no reason at all, <laughs> which, to be honest, I really love this episode and would have found a way anyway at all to get Stella to watch it, so I'm just going to make it work. Watching guys struggle with the life of the human man he's unwillingly thrown into is honestly so fun and so well done and Darren Morgan once again knocks it out of the fucking park with the writing that is both funny and poignant and obviously bat crap crazy <laughs> I think there's also an argument to be made that Mulder is being kind of toxic in this episode too being like whiny my life work and Scully's like I'm just gonna let you figure it out I'm yeah. gonna go get a dog I'm just gonna you're gonna talk at me as you are wont to do this is my life I've committed yeah. to this <laughs> also there's that peeping Tom, that's not great. Yeah, there's there's a lot of toxic masculinity in this episode, but I picked it specifically because of this great monologue about like, why am I like this? Why do I have this weird monologue in my head? I'm so aggressive now. Like, it's just such great boiled down writing on the toxicity of men, especially when and you, humanity, and when you become one un unwillingly too. It just works so well. All right, you ready to dig it in there, Mr. Spock? Sure thing, pal. <laughs> What most humans generally find impossible to understand is the need to shut out the bedlam of other people's thoughts and emotions. Or of their own thoughts and emotions. And now, up top, a quick-ish episode summary. The Enterprise has been assigned to escort Medusin Ambassador Kolos along with psychologist and telepath Dr. Miranda Jones. It is a slightly perilous assignment, however, as Medusans are non-humanoid creatures whose outward appearance are so hideous as to cause all humanoids who see them to go insane. Both Spock and Dr. Jones can look upon Kolos with a special visor due to their Vulcan-trained mental shields. Spock escorts them to their rooms, but while doing so is met with hostility and jealousy from Dr. Jones. At dinner later that night, in her honor, Kirk and Bones flirt shamelessly, wondering how someone so beautiful can condemn herself to a life of what they perceive to be ugliness, while Spock continuously insists that he is not interested in usurping her assignment in an attempt to mind link with Kolos. Except for that he kind of is. Anyways, dinner is interrupted when Dr. Jones telepathically senses someone thinking about murder. Turns out that it's creepo Larry who went full stalker boy on Dr. Jones who gracefully, honestly, too gracefully, once again, gently turned him down. Instead of taking no, I don't know, probably the thousand no he's gotten from her for an answer, he decided the best way to win her heart was by murdering her assignment and trying to kill Kolos. Except, oops, he looked directly at Kolos and went mad. Dumbass. <laughs> in his madness, he takes control of the Enterprise and throws her outside the galaxy into the edges of space. And then he dies. Boy, bye. <laughs> With no navigational references, the Enterprise crew cannot return home. Kirk suggests that Kolos's superior navigational abilities could be of use, and Spock volunteers to mind meld with Kolos, allowing the two to pilot the Enterprise as one entity. Knowing that Dr. Jones will object, Kirk tries to distract her with his sex magic, but... Oh no, it doesn't work! <laughs> 
She tries to convince the crew that she is the logical choice. After all, she's already planning to mind meld with Kolos, but McCoy reveals that she is dun 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 blind and therefore cannot pilot the ship. Her banging jeweled caftan, as it turns out, is actually an elaborate sensor web. We love functional fashion. <laughs> Kolos and Spock meld and successfully return the Enterprise to known space, but Spock forgets to put the visor back on when he dissolves the link and goes mad after witnessing Kolos' true form. Dr. Jones attempts to pull him out of his insanity using her telepathy, but is apparently unable to help. Kirk, in a wildly inappropriate and shitty verbal assault, suggests that she, in her jealousy, does not really wish to. Enraged by the accusation, she makes one more attempt and succeeds in bringing Spock's mind back to reality. As Kolos and Dr. Jones prepare to depart... To the Medusan ship, Kirk rightfully apologizes. She thanks him for his insight, even if he was a dick about it, and makes nice with Spock, having a new appreciation for the Vulcan philosophy behind the eye deck. In the end, the crew stopped being sexist, ableist dumbasses and let her do her damn job. Thank fuck. What did you think about this episode? I really liked this episode. I'm so glad. I really, really like this episode, and it's not one that people talk about a lot, but I think it has a lot of nuances, and it's really, really interesting. And Diana Moldar, who you've seen before, is fucking so good in this yeah, episode. Yeah, she's really good in this episode. Yeah, I really liked this. I think this was a great choice for toxic masculinity because <laughs> holy, holy fuck, shit. all of them right away, right from up top. It's just like, God, you guys are doing the most, like really doing the most. It's wild. Also, I thought it was hilarious and also weird that Kirk was like, really, our last prejudice is against the ugly. Like, <laughs> what? So ridiculous. What is this? This is the same man that's like, the beauty's inside the whole time. Psych, LOL, if you're ugly, get fucked, I guess. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's wild. It's so wild. There's just like so much good stuff from like everybody in this episode, which I really like. And you kept saying it over and over while we were watching, but I love that Scotty just wants a friend. Scotty's the only one that's fucking chill in this episode. Yes. Because Larry, I didn't mention, but he's like one of the engineers that helped build the Enterprise. And so when Scott, when he beams aboard, Scotty's immediately like, oh, I would l like, let me show you to your quarters. I want to talk about the Enterprise. And then after that very awkward dinner where everybody was really inappropriate, Except for Scotty, who looked fly as hell in his yeah, he like did. his, his tartan. Yeah, he looked great. But it's like, hey, if you are done with dinner, Larry, if you want to come to my room and drink some scotch and talk about the Enterprise more, I'm totally down. And he's like, uh, I'm just gonna go to bed. And Scotty's like, okay, but I'm around if you want to talk about it. It's so cute. <laughs> he's like not hurt at all by the fact that he gets turned down. Yeah, because just, like, Scotty knows how to take no for an answer. Because yes! <laughs> Scotty is the only good man on this ship in this episode. Yeah, it was <laughs> wild. It was like, oh, that it's nice to have like a juxtaposition against like really toxic masculinity and then like really positive masculinity in a way that I really enjoyed. Like, <laughs> yeah. I love Scotty and like the, every single time we see episodes that feature him heavily, I'm like, man, I really love Scotty. I love Scotty. He's so good. And like, there were just so many good things about this. Like, that dinner is very fucking weird but like but she bites back too yeah that's the thing is that she was also doing the most and so i kind of liked that that it was like oh she does have a place among these men it's not like she's completely out of her element like she does belong here she's very capable and i like too that bones's whole thing is like well she's very pretty but also there's something wrong here and i'm gonna figure out what it oh, is my medicinal vibes are tingling <laughs> yeah. so i love that too they once again bones is like the one thing that can pull me out of the beauty of a woman is a good medical puzzle. And he's like, I'm ready. Let's figure this shit out. I love when they make the toast about like, you know, beauty or whatever. And Bones is like, can we allow her to like live her life in ugliness or whatever he says? And then she bites back and is like, how can you, a man who loves life and people bear to look at like disease, disease yep. and, and pain? And he's like, you know what? That's a really Touché, good point. you know what? You got me. Touché. You got me, ma'am. That's cool. I, I really like that she's presented at the beginning as kind of being a bitch because she's like has this jealousy vibe with Spock and stuff. But like as the episode progresses, you see why she's like that because yes. she's constantly being undermined. She's constantly being like pitied. Oh, there's something vulnerable about her. She's constantly being told how beautiful she is and why that means she shouldn't do her fucking job. Mm -hmm. And like if I was told that all the time and – undercut immediately i would be a bitch too yeah and i think it's a really good choice too in the writing for that especially that scene but really the whole episode that they keep referring to her as miranda she's dr jones Fucking and like yes that is something that happens to women 
constantly today still that Honestly, like just strip women of their titles like when i was writing the summary because i i look at other summaries and so i don't forget things and the summary i was working off kept saying miranda too and i specifically intentionally changed it to dr jones every time because i was like fuck you yeah it, it is such a weird like misogynistic thing to strip women of their titles in that way like she earned that title and you should call her by that it would be like if people just called captain kirk jim and like there are people who do that but who it's, have earned that right exactly it's an earned thing and so to just assume like it's okay to call you miranda even though like we have no form we have no previous bond and there's no reason for me to believe that this is okay especially because they make the point of introducing her as dr jones and mm-hmm. then she comes on and is a beautiful woman and they're like never mind we're just gonna call you miranda the whole time oh look at this girl oh. and they keep calling her girl too and it's like oh this is very good writing and mm-hmm. like the episode as a whole had so much clever stuff inside of it. Like she did a great job of blind acting. I think that she did a really, she committed to it really hard in a way that like, I didn't realize at first that that was what was happening. But as soon as you're aware that she's blind, like especially when she takes off her sensor field, like you can tell she's like not looking in the right place. She's like reacting to the sound. And then her eyes shift over. Like she did it. And like when uh, Kirk's trying to work his sex magic and they're in the like flower botanical conservatory, whatever and she touches the rose and she accidentally touches the thorn it's because she can't see it and i thought that that those were all very clever choices right and you don't know she's blind in that moment you don't know she's blind for two-thirds of the whole episode right exactly but she's always seen wearing that sensor web and i think that actress does who is diana moldar who we talked about before i think she does such a good job because like she is in before you know she's blind and she's wearing her sensor web, which she talks about how powerful it is. She's like, I can, mm-hmm. I know what your heart's doing. I know ex- exactly how close I am to a wall. I am functional. I can do all of this stuff. Mm-hmm. You see her move around and there is something off about it, right? Because she like, but it comes off as kind of just like a gracefulness or like mm-hmm. a, a stateliness almost. Yes. Like I walk very she feels like, like a upright diplomat. and like feels like a diplomat and she is really slow and deliberate in her movement. And you're like, oh, that's just like... But then when you find out it's because she's blind and she's reacting to her sensor web, you're like, oh, that's fucking brilliant acting. And then when the sensor web comes off and she does more traditional blind acting, you're like, this lady's so fucking good. Yeah, she does a really, really good job. I thought that she did a great job. I also like, too, the idea that when she senses with her telepathy that Larry is thinking of murder, she doesn't know where it's directed at. And it's unclear, like, is it directed at Kolos because he's pissed that she's taken this assignment and won't just, like, marry him because that's what he wants? Or is he pissed at the men in the room who are flirting with her and he's thinking in this moment, I want to murder these men? Also, I thought was also, like, a great part of that, like, toxic masculinity theme that we're working off of because it does present itself in lots of different ways where I'm jealous If I can't have you, no one else can have you, including your career, including these other men, too. So I thought that was also, like, a really good piece of the overall episode. I really think it's interesting and important, too, especially considering it's the 60s, that she makes it clear that they have never had a relationship. He has wanted a relationship with her, and she has consistently said no, tactfully, and he keeps coming back and coming back and be like, but I'm a man and you're a woman. She's like, it doesn't matter. I don't want to be with you. Yes. And, like, there's that scene where he kisses her and she fucking stands there and doesn't give anything back, which is so awkward, but also, like, very, like, honestly, like, relatable of, like, there's this, like, crazy dude coming at me. I, like, she's fucking blind, too, right. alone in her room and, like, just has to gently let this guy down who was basically her fucking stalker and appreciate that it's not like, well, we were in love, but now I'm leaving. It's like, no, I've been telling you no. Like, I'm career interested. I went to Vulcan because I don't like being around humans because I have telepathy and you are thinking wild, murderous thoughts and mm-hmm. I don't like being around humans just because I'm pretty. Like, I don't even know what the fuck I look like. Yes. Like, mm-hmm. I don't care if I'm pretty. I don't want to feel these emotions. I want to do my job. I want to be in a place where I feel comfortable. And I just think that that is so nuanced and brilliant, Mm -hmm. especially for the fucking 60s. Yes, I completely agree with that. I also like, too, how before we know she's blind, you said this, too, when Kirk's trying to work his sex magic, like, Kirk literally cannot fathom not wanting to be in love. And then as soon as he finds out, like, oh, you can't see people, it, like, finally starts to click for him where he's like, 
Oh. Because his argument for that is like, someday you're going to want to be with somebody who looks like you. You're going to want to be, you're going to be overwhelmed by the ugliness or blah, blah, blah. And it's, she's like, no, I'm, I'm not. I'm really not. I'm really fucking not. I'm really competent and good at what I do. And, and also, made... I have telepathy. I don't want to be around you guys. And like, I've made this decision. Like, I made a choice for myself and I'm doing what I want and no one will respect that decision. And you don't even know me. I met you 24 hours ago. Yes. And you're trying to tell me how I should live my entire entire life yes. just because you cannot fathom making a similar choice which yes. is like kind of out of character for Kirk because I feel like Kirk a lot of times does a good job seeing like other people's perspectives but he's just like so overwhelmed by his fucking hormones or whatever because mm-hmm. like she is fucking gorgeous yes but he's just like I don't I don't know ugliness Ooh. yeah it's so <laughs> interesting that like I mean he says like this is our last prejudice and like they really heavily lean into that like can you imagine being in a place where you can't fall in love because you find someone beautiful and she's like literally all I want All I want is to not be surrounded by you fucking doofuses. like, I don't want to be pitied. I want to be respected. And I don't want to hear your weird sex thoughts. Yeah. (laughs) I'm tired. How fucking miserable to be able to hear every fucking thought that men feel about you when they find you beautiful. Like, horrific. Horrific. It it would be a prison. It would feel like a prison to live inside of that all the time. So I love that. And I also think, too, in that we were talking about her movement – I also read it knowing enough about Vulcans as she's gone to Vulcan and has like learned that kind of like diplomatic stately movement from them because they are so yeah like I'm controlled I'm reserved I've chosen this way to move too so I really like that I thought that that was additionally a like good piece of the like character I really liked too I liked Spock being jealous like he is obviously jealous he's like I can't accept this assignment because I my can't. life is here my life is here but I'm really interested in the idea of mind melding with because this, he like... loves mind melding yes if he anything we know about it. season three this bitch any chance he can mind meld he's like let me touch your face let me touch it let me touch it <laughs> <laughs> yeah I love that I love this like additional knowledge about Spock and that he he doesn't want to give up his life to go do ambassadorships. He really does want to be a part of this crew literally as long as he possibly can. But also, like, he is a Vulcan and he does love, or he's a partial Vulcan and does love knowledge and loves to learn and, like, really wants to just once even experience this. So I thought that that was a good choice, too. And I like that at the end, as he's becoming, his mind is coming back to him, his instinct is to mind meld with her and give her the information about how to mind meld with Kolos. Like, I just thought that that was very clever and, like, they don't really, like, explicitly say that that's what's happening, but because I know enough about how he mind melds with people, I know that she then knows from his experience how to make that connection with yeah, him. Yeah, they have this, like, they have this back and forth because Spock's really the only one that's not like sexually being shitty to her but he's being shitty to her in like a professional way frankly yes. and and they have this like back and forth that is very tense from both of them but then when she is bringing him out of that well A he sees her through Kolos's eyes too because mm-hmm. he melds with Kolos and, his, and Kolos has that where he like says the Tempest line to her and he's like don't like Kolos goes out of his way to be like don't wor- worry like we're still doing this I'm just getting us out of bum fuck nowhere in space Mm -hmm. like just relax you know I'm still your friend and I'm still here for you Mm -hmm. and then when Spock was mad or whatever we see Dr. Jones and Spock do that mind meld and do it together and I like that it it literally takes them being in each other's minds and being connected to Kolos to be like okay yeah all right we're sorry we're dicks and they have that really nice moment I like that they have these two moments around the eye dick which that little symbol that Spock wears, it stands for infinite diversity and infinite combinations. And it's like a Vulcan philosophy. And so Spock wears that at first and he says, like, well, it's to honor her. And she's like, are you just trying to, like, rub it in my face? I'm not like a real Vulcan. <laughs> and then at the end, they have a nice moment about that idea where it's like, I now understand what you're trying to say and how, like, the sharing of minds and sharing of cultures actually, like, makes us stronger. And so I I think that they have a really nice bookend Mm -hmm. of an interaction. And also I think, too, like, it when you know more about Spock and more about the series, like, part of what Spock struggles with is that people think he's not a real Vulcan. Right. And so I thought that that was also nice where he's like, I was trying to honor you. Like, I was maybe also being kind of a dick, but, <laughs> yeah. like... I can't help being petty. Yeah, because it's, it's like, like my ingrained default. in my DNA. <laughs> it's literally who I am. I don't even realize that 90% of the time it's I'm just, just who I am. <laughs> I am who I am, you know? And, but then at the end, it's like they have this common understanding of, like, neither of us are true, capital T, true Vulcans, but we 
choose to be part of this culture because we appreciate what it is that Vulcans do and what they want from the universe as a whole. So I just, I did really like that too. And I like that they have this like piece together connection at the end. I thought that was really nice. <laughs> Another like creepy Spock smiling episode. We've been watching like a ton of those lately. Yeah. It's just so disconcerting to see him like, hey. But it's a strong acting choice. Too. Yeah. It's like, it's not a full body swap. Like me and Colos are sharing the thing. But mm-hmm. like, I mean, that scene's really great where like, Spock's body says something in Colos's like cadence, and Bones is like, "That's, That's not, not Spock." Spock. <laughs> and then Spock says something very Spock, and Bones whips around with a big That's fucking Spock! smile on his face. That's Spock. It was <laughs> so good. I loved it so much. Yeah. It was so nice. And like that smile from Bones reminded me too of Star Trek Four when they're like on the bridge, and he's like, "Oh my God, it's my husband. I love it so much." <laughs> I just th- I like that a lot. I liked that interaction a lot. I love the way that the crew and specifically Kirk and Bones care so fucking deeply for Spock and are like so deeply concerned about his well being and what's going to happen to him. And like, it's funny though because they they're never like, oh yeah, you definitely want her job. They know like, you no, know, you're here. <laughs> yeah, you here for life, bro. Like we know <laughs> we know what's up here. We'll all go home together. Everything will be great. We'll discuss this. It's fine. So I like that that felt like an additional piece of that where they were just like, we just want him back. We just want him to yeah. return to what he was before. So I liked that a lot. One of the things that I really liked was when Colas was processing as he's about to leave Spock's body that monologue that it gives about the aloneness and and the the part about language which is really interesting yes. he's like it's rely so heavily on this, this and is... you like don't understand it yeah. like I really enjoyed that and I thought it was a really interesting it's something we'll talk too about when we get to the X-Files episode but that's something that really tied these episodes together that inside of this toxic masculinity theme both of them very explicitly address the loneliness of what it's like to be man and specifically a man in these circumstances which is true like that's part of the thing about toxic masculinity is that it isolates you and it makes you feel like I have to be this very specific way and this is what a man is and this is how a man acts and it's isolating and it makes you unconnected from the rest of humanity and like that's what's really important about humanity is the connections that we can make with each other and so I really like that they have this very specific piece of as a human, you are alone and you are inside of this shell of a human being. And like you have these senses, which is amazing, but you rely so heavily on having to make connections. Mm-hmm. And if you don't, you're alone. I just really enjoyed that. I liked that a lot. And just as like a cinematography thing, I love that first person fight with Spock where he's on the bridge. With the fish eye too. Yes. Like, it's so- where Kirk's like, come into my arms, baby. And he's like, get the fuck away yes. from me. <laughs> I just love that. I thought it was a really clever way to shoot it. And especially for... Yeah, this director loves a fish eye lens. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I love a fish eye lens too. So I appreciate that. But I liked that as a choice too for someone who is in their mind but is losing their mind it felt so appropriate too it didn't just feel like we're gonna make this cool well, choice it's used twice and it's used twice really well because it's used yeah. for the fight but then it's used when Dr. Jones and Spock are doing the like mind meld together because mm-hmm. you see them like it's interspersed with like flashes of the fight and flashes of you know what happened with Larry and then these like weird shots of her face which I actually think is really cool too because the whole episode's like she's so beautiful she's so beautiful and then they do these really distorting and yes. ugly shots of her face. Mm-hmm. And I really like that. Yeah, I agree. It felt like it was a comment from the Colos perspective of like, I think she's hideous. Yeah. And like she says at one point, like, who are we to say that they are hideous? It, could they not also be viewed as so beautiful we can't really comprehend it as human beings? So I thought that was a nice like piece of... A, like a mirroring piece yeah. of that where like they're not going to just objectify her because they view her as a hideous corporal form. Like it was just so smart. Or they so don't smart. even think about it that way. They're yeah. just like, whatever. She's like, how's this lumpy stuff. human with a bunch of like skin or whatever. And they're like, we're pretty lights. We're in the Spock. I also love there's a line that Colo says, I think when he's inside of Spock where he's like, oh, you guys call us Medusans. And I like that he's like, we don't call ourselves that, but you were like, oh, you're so ugly, so you must be like Medusa where you kill somebody with your ugliness. And they're like, whatever. If that's what you need to describe us, we accept. But like, Fine. that's also fucking dumb. It says way more about you than it does about exactly. us. Exactly. And yeah. I, I like that Colas kind of like brings it up as like, a, okay, whatever. Yeah. Yep. I totally agree. 
Yeah, I really liked this episode. I I thought it was really good. What do you think about Kirk's monologue when he starts to lose it because Spock's dying and he whips in that room and is like, Ugh! It felt like, how dare you do such a thing to my husband? Will you not just give up and bring him back? Like, it, as with Bones, where, like, oh, I can get over how beautiful you are because I've got this medical puzzle I want to solve. With Kirk, it feels like I can get over how beautiful you are because what I really care about is Spock and his well-being. And so him realizing, too, like, I probably went way too far with this, it didn't feel inappropriate. Right. It felt like, yeah. It felt like a temper tantrum. Yes. It was like, ah, yes, I can see how this man later blows up a planet because he's so in <laughs> love with Spock. Like, the, this all, like, really tracks for me. Everything I know about Kirk is like, ah, yeah, you want dad ass so badly that you will do, like, <laughs> fucking literally whatever. You will blow up at a woman. Like, and he never feels like he's going to physically harm her no, either. Yeah. It just feels like I'm so frustrated and can't you just fucking do this thing? And he does push her to do the fucking thing, too. Right, like, I don't think... He accuses her of, like, deliberately not trying, which I don't think she is. I think she just is... She's doing the basic stuff, and she's trying, and she's like, this is hard, and I don't know how to do it. And then, in what is very subtle cheeks energy gets so pissed at the students like fine I'm gonna do it and I'm gonna do it so fucking good (laughs) so like even though it was really inappropriate and Kirk definitely like he apologizes afterwards and is like hey I'm sorry here's this rose and she's like I mean, you were a dick, but, like, it did help, so, like, let's call this a fucking wash. Yeah. <laughs> um, like, it is just a very relatable moment, I yes, think. Yes, I completely agree. And I feel like, too, it's that... You'll that... undermine me for the last time. <laughs> yeah, and we were talking, too, about, like, it fits into the toxic masculinity idea of, like, I'm so frustrated, I feel like this woman should be doing more, and she's just not, and, like, she's making this choice not to. And then once he's removed from that, the rage and anger of that moment and can objectively look at it he's like oh yeah i fucked up yeah. i should not have done that I he even have... says that like if spock dies it's probably my fault yes and like it, it's like he finally gets pulled out of the fog of the toxic masculinity where he's like oh shit i really fucked that up i, I really, really lo- let my emotions take over in this moment where it was inappropriate yeah i really like the line she says too where she like puts her hands on his face and says to the death or life of us both and she's like i'm doing it all the way yeah mm-hmm. which is great it's great like character stuff for for them too, and I do also like that you get the bookend of their relationship too, where Kirk is like this flirty, like "Oh, you're so beautiful to your beauty" or whatever. And at the end, he was like, "Okay, so I was a dick. I'm really sorry. Here is this rose. Can we be friends? You're gonna be great at your job. You're gonna be really good. I was way out of line." Mm-hmm. And you kind of get that with Bones too. Bones is more just like old timey, like old man perv that we've seen before, always. But then you do have that moment where he does out her as being blind and he even says like the only reason I'm doing this or says something about this like the only reason I'm doing this because you cannot pilot this ship like you know you can do a lot and like I respect that and I wasn't going to fucking tell anybody about your your privacy is important but also like we have to be realistic here yeah Mm -hmm. and he has that kind of nice moment with her then and so I, I like that even though they all were acting like assholes they do kind of come to the realization of like okay oh I fucked that up oh I'm sorry okay I'm sorry yeah, it's a really good episode, and I feel like not enough people talk about how good it is. Yeah. But it is kind of a nuanced episode. It's not an episode that you just throw on and you're like, ooh, Star Trek time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would agree with that. One of my favorite things about this episode is that, and I think that you can tell, but that it is written by a woman. Yeah. Oh, you can absolutely <laughs> yeah. tell it's written by a woman. Her, 100%. It's written by Jean Lissette Arose, which is also, I think this is so interesting. So she's a former librarian, and she was a Star Trek fan, and she is one of four writers that have no television writing credits and sold the script to the program. She wrote this, sent it in. One of the producers saw it and was like, Jean, you should look at this. This is pretty good. And then they bought it, and they shot it. She also wrote one other episode which is also in the season called All Our Yesterdays, which is another one of those episodes that I'm like, this episode's a banger. Why don't more people talk about this? And it also has like a lot. It's a great Spones episode. Yeah. You are going to love Ooh. it. I just think that's so fascinating and also like speaks to the history of Star Trek and how Im- important it was, but also how heavily involved the fans were even at that time. I mean, it got a third season because of a write-in campaign. People... Literally, we're like, I wrote a script. Do you want to see? And, and the producers are like, this is fucking pretty good. And like bought scripts from four different people who are not television writers. And I mean, it was a great choice because mm-hmm. I don't think a writing room full of 
men could have written this. No, they absolutely could have. And you can re- and you were saying it too while we were watching, but you can tell from the dinner scene like everyone's being very aggressive, but that's what it's like to be a woman yeah. in a room full of men who are trying to undermine your competence. And they're not and the thing about that scene too is like none of them if you were like you were being like creepy there they'd be like no I was just like you know whatever I'm just trying like, to tell you it's, yeah. it's a compliment you can't say nothing to nobody <laughs> yeah none of them would have realized how fucking out of line they were yes absolutely which is also like relatable and like from being the only woman at a table of five men where they're all directing their energy at you like woof boy <laughs> oh Jesus Christ <laughs> so yeah I think that's really really fascinating and like good on her because she wrote two of my absolute favorite episodes that do not get enough credit I think they don't get enough credit because they're kind of like buried in season three and season three is like up and down but they're bangers so the reason that Diane Muldar is in this episode is because they had a, an actress already lined up for this but she couldn't do it for some reason and they were looking for somebody and the director of this, Ralph Sineski, is the same person who directed Return to Tomorrow, which is the other episode she was in. He was like, man, it would be great if we could just get her. And then he was like, can we get her? <laughs> and there, before that was like, it's disputed whether or not this was a real thing. But there was an idea that you couldn't recast you know, people, which is like obviously not true because it does happen. But they finally were like, okay, we can use her, but we got to change her hair color, which is why she has dark hair. And then there was like a running joke because they were supposed to have a season four and they were like, I wonder what she looks like with red hair. Because <laughs> she's so fucking good. She's yeah. really good in both of those, those episodes. And it's just exciting too and like cool that she comes back and does like a whole season in TNG, even though it's like a season that, you know, she's a, some people like her character, some people don't. But like, I just think the legacy of her in Star Trek is really neat. Mm-hmm. Obviously, like... The idea of somebody who being blind and piloting a starship has a different tone when we get to TNG because we have Geordi who has the visor, which I guess the argument could just be made that that's like more advanced technology. And, you know, I do think that Miranda or Dr. Jones could have done it because she was like, I can see everything. Also, I'm a fucking telepath. Also, I will be mind linked with Kolos who knows how to pilot. So, like, I think you guys are all being dicks, but whatever. I digress. But I do think it is interesting and cool, especially considering the 60s, that her disability is, like, handled really deftly. Yes. And the idea of, like, I made a joke about it in the summary, like, we love functional fashion, but, like, hell yeah, we love functional fashion. Yes. How amazing would that be if something like that existed? Yep. And you could just, A, it looks fucking dope. Yeah, it does. <laughs> it's great design. But also, like, it allows her that especially paired with her telepathy, allows her to have, like, what we would consider a normal life. Right, yep. Obviously, there's, like, a lot of Shakespeare references in this, but LOL, at Star Trek, there's always some kind of Shakespeare reference. And then the title is also a reference to a poem that I didn't write down because apparently I didn't give a shit. (laughs) Also, I think in terms of, like, fanfic and stuff, I love Star Trek when they, like, quote Shakespeare and they quote all of the like poems and stuff because it has definitely been turned into like fanon that like Jim Kirk loves to use quotations because he's just like a sweet soft history boy who has like he collects like books even though you know everything's digital now and he has his glasses which are canon you mm-hmm. know that's true that's true <laughs> also if you want any fix where it's all about the glasses anyways I have them <laughs> Chris Pine looks really hot in glasses, so you know a bunch of people were like, he's Captain Kirk. Captain Kirk wears glasses. Chris Pine looks hot all the yeah, time. Yeah, Chris like, Pine is on. the Get hottest. Out of here. Anyways. <laughs> and then the other big thing that happens is we talked about the IDEC, the infinite diversity and infinite combinations, which is like, it's introduced in this episode and it becomes a recurring theme throughout the rest of the series, is something that shows up in a lot of Vulcan heavy episodes. A lot of it gets expanded on. It comes from the time of Surak. It is an important thing. It it hilariously and annoyingly, Roddenberry actually created it because he was like, oh, I could create this cool thing and then I could merchandise it and sell it. I just want to merchandise and sell it. LOL, destroy capitalism, except. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> Nimoy and Shatner were both really annoyed by that because this is pre-80s where everything TV show was just made to sell shit. And so it was like, no, we're actually like doing shit here and this episode is philosophically like pretty deep and you just want to throw a commercial in the middle of it like fuck you dude even William Shatner said he said Gene Roddenberry inserted a speech by Kirk praising the philosophy and associated metal the speech was pointless according to William Shatner a thinly veiled commercial for replicas of the metal which Roddenberry's company Lincoln Enterprises sold to fans so like Nimoy didn't want to do it because he's all about like deep philosophy and stuff and Shatner was like I don't want to be in a commercial yeah (laughs) 
Which, you know, it's, I do appreciate Star Trek and their, I love that they were like, let's turn this thing that just was like a toy and turn it into this deep philosophical thing that permeates through all of Star Trek. And also we'll still sell it. (laughs) Gotta make money. Gotta make money. Also, finally, it's never made clear exactly where the Enterprise has been thrown. They just say like the galactic barrier and to the edges of space. But just a shout out to my favorite movie, Star Trek V, The Final Frontier. They also go to the like Great Barrier and the edges of space. So they already know how to get there. They're like, oh, pretty. we gotta go to Eden? Pfft, we know how to get there. That's so pretty. It is pretty. That's where God lives. Well, it's pretty. That makes sense. <laughs> God's like, this regular space? Fuck that. Fuck that. Anyways, this episode's a banger and everybody should watch it. Yep, I agree. Synopsis showdown? Let's do it. One woman's epic struggle to just do her damn job. That's all I wrote. Wow. I had a really hard time with this one, but also true. True. That is really true. (laughs) A beautiful woman comes onto the ship and all the men lose their absolute fucking minds, but turns out she's blind and they all learn that there's more to life than being hot. Yeah. All right. You ready for Mulder? It's me. Always. Well, they were all mutilated in exactly the same manner. However, the third victim wasn't wearing any clothes. Maybe he was a nudist. Took a midnight hike in the nude, got attacked by a wolf or a lion or a bear. Maybe all at the same time. So I'd like to go out. All right. Here we go with this summary. <laughs> <laughs> Cracks every bone in body. Let's right, here go. we go. Let's do it. <laughs> a man is murdered in the woods of Oregon, and Scully and Mulder are called in to figure out if it's an animal, a serial killer, or some other strange creature as described by the witnesses. Mulder, still somehow struggling with his belief in the unexplained, insists that they shouldn't jump to conclusions and should gather proof first. A literal first for Mulder, but I guess age mellows you out, whatever. While investigating a truck stop, they have an encounter with what might be the mysterious creature, and Mulder really proves himself to be a boomer by being literally incapable of using a cell phone to take a photo. <laughs> it's just the app. It's the app that's It's the app working. that's the problem. It's not me. It's the app. <laughs> it's the app who is wrong. <laughs> They return to the creepiest hotel of all time where the proprietor has accidentally seen the creature while trying to be a peeping Tom and Scully, it's the voice of a generation, tells Mulder he's batshit crazy, except, you know, 2016 network television style. Scully finds the mysterious man working in a cell phone store and he promptly trashes the place and runs out. I mean, who among us has not wanted to destroy our workplace and run away, right? Am I right? <laughs> Mulder finally encounters the man who he suspects can turn into a lizard in a graveyard, sadly drinking his woes away, only to be told that he's not, in fact, a man who can turn into a monster, but a lizard who was bitten by a human and now transforms into a human man during the day, totally against his will. He gives a great speech about the hopelessness of sentience and the futility of leading these dumbass human lives and somehow brings Mulder down to his normal, insane self while they drink whiskey together in a graveyard. (laughs) Meanwhile, as usual, Scully is doing actual detective work and it discovers that the animal control agent with whom they saw the monster in the truck stop is actually the killer. Something, something, rabies? Unclear. Mulder goes to tell Guy as he is shedding his clothes and his human life to return to the woods, and right before his very eyes sees him transform back into his lizard shape in order to skip merrily off and go hibernate for 10,000 years. Possible? Who knows? The end! (laughs) How did you feel about this episode? This episode's very fun. Yes. Uh, Another Darren Morgan banger. (laughs) Absolutely. He does nothing but bangers. (laughs) I mean, the beginning, it starts off very funny with those two drug addicts in the woods, which you say are important drug addicts. Yes. I will talk about <laughs> it in the, the fan lore, but they are in several episodes. Also, the, the just the visual of, like, the gold paint. It's really good. <laughs> it works super well. What do you think of when you see the full moon? I think about turning into a werewolf. What would you do if you're a werewolf? And drugs. Get really high. <laughs> <laughs> but as a werewolf. I mean, yeah. I mean, I want to do the drugs, but I do want to be a werewolf. <laughs> Or a vampire. You know what? I'm not picky. <laughs> just turn me into a monster. I just want to be a monster. <laughs> the special effects and makeup are really good in this. Like, yes. obviously, it's 2016. Correct. So they have, like, better special effects in a budget. But it's very big, like, Buffy demon vibes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> His whole speech at the beginning where he's like, ugh, I thought I loved the X-Files, but fuck. Look at all these things. They were unexplained. I used to believe in them. They're all fake. They're all college pranks. Why couldn't I see this? <laughs> was really good. It did remind me. It was an interesting parallel to his, like, everything's futile in Hollywood AD, too, mm-hmm. where he was just like, oh, is this my life? <laughs> is this what I'm doing? It's something he struggles with constantly. 
all the time. But it makes sense. Like, if you've devoted your whole life to the paranormal, as things become explained and the internet becomes more of a part of our human lives, like, like Scully says later, like, the internet, the internet is, is not, not good, good for, for you, Mulder. <laughs> like, and it's true because on one hand, he can find explanations for things that were previously unexplained. And then in other episodes in season 10, they talk about conspiracy theories. And like yeah. that stuff is also very dangerous for someone who is like really ready and willing to believe in shit too. So I think they do a good job of like hitting that mix in season 10. I do love though that he gives that whole speech and she's just waiting for him to end and just patiently waiting. I do love that by this season, Scully just patiently waits through the monologues. Mm-hmm. She's like, it'll end eventually. Yes. <laughs> and she's like, we got another case. And he's like, okay. And she's like, it does have a monster in it. You can see him just suppress the smile because like there's still a part of him that wants to believe. Yeah, he wants to believe. He always has wanted to believe. That monologue feels more like him trying to convince himself that he doesn't want to believe anymore. Yes. And like Scully sees right through that. She's like, okay. Like, if you need to do this, I'll just be here waiting for you. Whatever you want, Mulder. A lot of this episode is Scully just getting out of his way so he can come to the realization that he does actually want to be in the X-Files. Yes, absolutely. 100%. <laughs> Scully knows her job. Yes. <laughs> totally. <laughs> this episode is great because it has so many, because it's 2016, so it has so many, like, you know, the whole time I was like, is that Kamel? Is that Shandula? Yes. <laughs> like, that was really fun. And then Reese Darby is like, perfect casting. Yes. Like, absolute perfect casting. Absolutely. And, like, just knowing Kumail and, like, how he is, like, a nerd that gets to, gets to be in all of these properties that he loves. Like, every time I see him in something, I'm, like... I watched an episode of The Twilight Zone that he was in, and now he's in Marvel stuff. And seeing him in this X-Files, I was like, man, you really are living the nerd dream, and yes. I'm, like, happy for you. Yep, <laughs> like, totally good agree. for you, dude. And he's funny. He's really good in this episode. Like, the whole scene in the beginning with him being the dog catcher and stuff. But then, like, when he's revealed to be a serial killer and tries to do his whole serial killer monologue, and they're like, no. <laughs> we do we, not have time for this. <laughs> we do not care about this at all. And he's save like, but I have a trial. Yeah, it's like, if you want press, like, just save it for that because we do not give a fuck. <laughs> Serial killers are so boring to us. You are boring to us. And he's like, no, but I killed people. And it's like, that is the most boring thing I've heard all day. Yeah. And like Mulder says at the beginning, like, I gave up serial killers way before I gave up <laughs> monsters. I don't give a fuck about any of that. I love that. <laughs> yes. That was great. And also, like, super fun to see Shangela, right? Like, yes! I love it. I Like, I didn't know Shangela was into the X-Files, but, like, the only reason people are in this is because they're into the X-Files. They're like, I want to be part of this! Well, and Shangela's been in lots of movies now. I mean, she was in that Oscar movie that Lady Gaga was in that Nick wants me to watch, but I don't want to watch. A Star is Born. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was said Born Again. That's not yeah, right. he really wants me to watch it. I don't want to watch it. I don't give a fuck about it. <laughs> I do think, like... I think the trans stuff probably could have been handled better. Like, I can see that they were trying to handle it well, especially where Mulder was like, no, it's people do it all the time. It's fine. But they there were a little bit of punching down stuff, even with the Shangela stuff. But, like, you know, I mean, it's it's true in many ways that a lot of, like, black trans women become sex workers, but it also did feel kind of like a punchline. So that was kind of lame. But, like, from now to 2021 to, like, how we talked about 2016 there has been a huge like positive like reframing of a lot of things which is great and it's even for 2016 it's not terrible (laughs) at least and you have to remember too that this is a network show on fox yeah and there's a lot of stuff especially in season 10 where the writers are like eat our fucking dicks we're gonna do whatever we want we're gonna poke fun at the fact that you're fox and we're gonna do this shit which i like a lot and i i agree that there's that like punching down aspect to when they're talking to shangela but i do like but shangela does have like a lot of agency and kicks a demon's ass or a lizard guide but like whatever yeah and i like too that when Mulder's in that conversation with guy he's like no it's no that's people can do this that's they're called transgender people this is like a very normal thing it happens all the time no it doesn't you you can't this isn't gonna work for you they have you have to cut your genitals off. He's like, oh, never. Oh, no. That That is a lot. And I kind of like that, too, that Guy has this moment of like, oh, you definitely wouldn't do this unless you really wanted to do yeah, this. So I thought that fair. that was like handled well, again, for like a Fox Network television In show. In 2016. Yes, yeah. exactly. That scene where uh, Scully is doing the autopsy and they're kind of like working through it. And she's like, so we're looking for a man-sized horn lizard with human teeth and they just stare at each other and she was like this is fun yeah i like, this. I like that we're doing this again yeah <laughs> that was I a really how moment. fun this can be that especially paired with like after when they're in the motel and he goes on his like one-sided conversation where he's like i know you're gonna say this and then you're gonna say this and she's just kind of trying to say something but also letting him talk and at the end she's like 
That's my Mulder. <laughs> yeah. This is the Mulder I like. Yeah. yeah. And he's I like, love- you believe me? She's like, no way, but this is fun. <laughs> yeah. I love, too, that there's that, like, great moment where it, he's tossing the files away at the beginning when he's monologuing. And then when they come back to him in the hotel, he's got the file and just throws it at her <laughs> at the bed like classic Mulder. It's just so good. There's so much, like, fan servicey stuff in season 10, which some people complained about. And I was just like, Why no. Why you complain about I'm that? a fan. I have waited so long for this to come back. Fan service me. This is what I want. And so I love those, like, little details, especially in this, especially with Darren Morgan. Like, you know he yeah. wrote that into the script. Mulder suddenly has a file which he now has put together and throws at Scully like it's just classic X-Files and it's just put together so fucking well yeah and I mean even me at this point like I noticed certain stuff like the Kim Manners gravestone like that yeah. was like a really nice homage mm-hmm. and and it was used a lot like that was really yeah. great I love that Mulder just slept in a graveyard <laughs> of course he did that's who he is I love that he calls it falling off the wagon too <laughs> I fell off the wagon I'm back on the monster train and I fell hard Scully's like whatever dumbass <laughs> I fell hard I love the scene in the motel where he finds the like creepy like pee pee tom backstage thing and he is non plus yes he just walks through, he's not scared at all he's just like whatever and then he's like you know I'm not I'm not going to tell on you like this is my fault. Yeah. We knew when we checked into here. this fucking motel. But also, like, you better tell me everything you fucking see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. There's just... And like you said, too, when there's the face hole and you're like, you're just going to stick his fucking face in this hole. <laughs> like, yeah. That's what Mulder Just does. love how calm he is through that whole scene. Even when he pops out back into the proprietor's office, he's like, hey, so... Found this. Yeah. So you want to really tell me what's going on? <laughs> I'm an FBI agent. You don't really have a choice. Here I am. I love the scene in the psychiatrist's office, too, where the psychiatrist is like, I just told him to go to the graveyard because, like, we're all going to die. So, like, what's the point of being anxious about it? Memento mori. Woo! <laughs> I was like, do you think that's good advice? He's like, that's what I do. <laughs> that's literally what I do. And we know someone who does that. So. <laughs> True. It's uh, not a totally unheard of thing <laughs> that people go to the cemetery to relax. I also love that he tries to prescribe him pills. He's like, who's more crazy, the guy who thinks he turns into a lizard or the guy that believes him? Mulder's like, okay, get fucked. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> Though at the beginning, Scully asks Mulder, have you been taking your meds? And so it's implied, too, that Mulder is actually taking medication. <laughs> or medi- should be. <laughs> should be taking medication at this point <laughs> or does at least sporadically. Scully's probably the one who wrote him the prescription. She was like, please, for the love of God, love stop of God. showing up at my house at 2.30. Here's a fucking sleeping pill prescription. I mean, Guy's whole monologue of, like, a great twist of being like, I got bit by a human. I'm just like a nice lizard man. Mm-hmm. Like, well, I don't want any of this. Like, I turned into a human. Now I need a job. And I had to get a dog because it's the only thing that brings me joy. And uh, I lie about sex. This sucks. I hate this. Yes. Mm-hmm. I like how he, too, it's like, I woke up and I became aware of my own self-consciousness. And it sucks. It sucks to hear your own voice in your head. Yeah, it <laughs> does. It super does. <laughs> it's just a great monologue, too. And, like, interspersed with the scenes. And that's also, like, uh, the unreliable narrator type thing, too, because we see the peeping Tom see, like, you're a monster, and we assume, like, oh, he was bit or whatever. And then it's like, no, he's a monster because he's looking at his, like, human face and is like, no. I'm sick of looking at you. I hate looking at you every day. And it's <laughs> he like, throws oh. the clock on the ground. Oh, I hate you, too. I will like not you. be beholden to you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. True. It's a it's a super fun episode. And also, like, I like that, A, the scene where Scully steals the dog is great. And it's like, this is my dog now. <laughs> and I like that Mulder gets to watch him transform. And yes. lots, watch, like, he gets real, like, it's not proof in that he can show anybody, but he gets personal proof to mm-hmm. be like, oh, maybe this isn't futile. Yeah. That guy's not a monster, but he's definitely an unknown being. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That I'll never see because he's going to go sleep for 10,000 years. <laughs> <laughs> I love, too, that... He's when Mulder's talking to him and he's telling him the story, he's like, But why did you transform again at night? It was nighttime. I'm just looking for some internal logic. And guy's like, Why? <laughs> There's no external logic. Why do you care? Like, this is just the way it fucking is. And then at the end, when he's like, That's not possible for you to hibernate for 10,000 years. And he's like, It just is. Peace out, bye. And he's like, <laughs> Skips into the woods. Like, I love that. It's again, it's very 
self-referential. It's very Darren Morgan to be like, yeah, this is the X-Files. It's silly and it's stupid and it just yeah. is. This Stop is just trying to figure it out. Yeah, exactly. Just Stop let trying. it roll over you. Enjoy yes, the ride. Exactly. It's uh, it's just so – and like knowing that this is Darren Morgan's return to the series that he left after Jose Chung and this is his return, it's just like – such a great mark of like, man, you still fucking got it. Yeah. You know exactly what this series is and you know exactly how to treat this. I like David Duchovny in season 10 and 11 too because like meta textually like and after seeing episodes like Hollywood AD, like we know that he was like really dissatisfied and then he left and had his whole fucking <laughs> crisis or whatever. <laughs> and like to come back in 2016 is a choice and he's obviously accepted like, no, this is really important and I do care about this and I do love it. And I feel like you... Even in the, like, jaded Mulder, like, I feel like you can feel like David Duchovny is happy to be there, yeah. which is nice. Mm -hmm. I love when he's giving that monologue at the beginning, too. And he's like, I'm a middle-aged man. No, no, I am. I and am. He's like, yeah. Yeah, we're in our fucking 50s, you dumbass. <laughs> in these seasons, Mulder is older than the cigarette smoking man is in the pilot, which is so fucking weird. And, like, I love, too. And I think they do an appropriate job of mellowing him out in ways that like yeah this is what happens to human beings as right. they get older like even if you still remain very much in your personality and in your ideals and you're still very connected to that you just mellow you just do like you don't really have a choice because your body starts to break down and you just have to relax a little yeah. bit like that's just human nature and like Mulder is also part of that even though he's a psycho <laughs> like he is a human being well I like that we see yeah like Young Mulder also has, like, pretty deadpan delivery and stuff, but he is, like, very excitable in many ways and mm -hmm. does have, like, puppy dog energy a lot. And, like, older Mulder is so flat, but in, like, an appropriate way. Yes. He's like, I'm just trying to follow along. And he's, like, a acerbic in, like, in a way that I feel like is inappropriate for a middle-aged man. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And Scully's just like, I'm just here to have a nice time. <laughs> She's like, I had a whole career while you were gone. I'm cool. I can do whatever. Yeah, whatever, man. I've accepted I'm a fed. I have this afloat for you. Welcome back. <laughs> uh, you want to get into fan apocrypha stuff? Sure. All right. Fantastic. <laughs> so the two stoners in the beginning, they don't have names. They're just stoner one and stoner two. They're played by Tyler Levine and Nicole Parker. They're in two other episodes, one with... For people who are listening, I'm not going to say the titles. It's the one with the cockroaches and then the one with the Loch Ness Monster. We'll get to the one with uh, the Nessie? cockroaches. Yes. Oh, we're not going to watch one Nessie? We were going to. And oh, that's, I switched it. That's okay. the one that we switched out. So I still stand by our decision. That theme is great. Oh, it's going to be really good. <laughs> we're getting to it in this season. It's going to be excellent. Uh, and also, I think that that one's in a season that we can like release you to watch the rest okay. of it, too. So you'll be able to see that one. That's, a, very, that's a really good episode. And, like, it was just delightful to see them pop up. And when I watched it for the first time, I literally yelped. I was so excited to see them. Because <laughs> they, I like that they're like, do you ever think, like, maybe we should be doing something else with our lives? And they're like, no, I like this. This is who we are. And, like, sometimes people talk shit about people who, like, get high all the time. But, like, if you're living your life and you're and You're paying, not hurting anybody. Yeah. Who gives a shit? Like... That's fine. And, like, I think it's very funny that they make the visual choice to do the gold paint. They're like, ah, and paint in the woods or whatever. <laughs> but it works. And I, like, I love that they brought them back. I just thought it was, again, like, a very delightful fan service -y thing to Especially do. Especially in an episode where, like, a character is like, I just wake up and I go to my job and I'm sad and I have all this anxiety and whatever. And these two stoners are like, should we be doing something with our lives? No, we're happy. Yeah. Oh, then fuck it. Who cares? Yes, exactly. I just, I really like that. I thought that that was really great. The script is based on a script called The M Word that Darren Morgan wrote for Frank Spotness's short-lived show Night Stalker. And that show got canceled before they could use this script. And so once it was decided the X-Files would be revived, Morgan was like, this script. I'm going to have to like heavily revise it and stick Mulder and Scully into it. But like this idea works and it's yeah. going to be good. And honestly, I feel like I've never seen Night Stalker, but there's no way it could have worked better for that show than for this one. Like, there's just... But part of it is that it's got Mulder and Scully in it. And if it didn't have Mulder and Scully in it, I could see right. how it would, like, fit differently. The idea of, like, a, quote, monster being turned into a human is a really interesting thing that yes. you could put into different lores or whatever right. and put the appropriate characters in. But the way that it's written for this makes a lot of sense. Yes, absolutely. Morgan wrote this episode to comment on the nature and format of the Monster of the Week's episodes themselves because there is, like... 
what is the logic here? And again, why are you looking for the logic? Like, just, just let, let it wash over you. You've got to just give up on the logic sometimes. Uh, Reese Darby said on the script, when he usually films, he really enjoys improvising because he's a comedy actor, obviously, and he likes ad-libbing bits to make things funnier. But he said that Morgan's script, he found it unnecessary. The writing was perfect. I couldn't deviate off of the tracks. Normally, as a comic actor, I like to improvise and try to make things funnier than they appear on paper. But here, there was no improvement that I could make. Which is like, That's great. It's such a nice thing to say as a comedic actor about comedic writing. Like, you've already nailed this so fully and completely. I don't need to do anything else. It's is just like chef kiss perfect. <laughs> like there is a lot of very serious, personal, philosophical, am I who I think I am? Do I have to be this person? And yet they still hit these very funny notes throughout the whole thing, which I think they do a really fucking good job as. Camille Nunjani was cast in the show because he hosted a podcast called The X-Files Files, which like I've listened to and I like. Part of it is that it's very of its time. It yeah, was, it was like a decade ago. Yeah, it was literally the first podcast about the X-Files, too. So it it's very of its time. He does a really good job of doing research inside of it and like getting writers and actors from the show to come out and talk about it. But if you listen to it now, it just feels different because yeah. it is just very much of its time. But Morgan enjoyed the podcast so much because he said that he really liked the way that Camille talks about the critical thinking on the series like as a whole and that's part of what Darren Morgan does is that he's very meta and he talks about like the concept of the show inside of the shows himself and so he was like I'm gonna offer you this part and so I love he's great in this part yeah and so I love that it's not just Camille being like I really want to be on this show it was the show being like we want you to be on this show we would really love for you to be a part of it and Camille was worried that the fans would think that he ruined the show and he jokingly said it's like being in love with a gorgeous woman for 20 years and then when you finally go out with her you end up murdering her (laughs) (laughs) it's like it but he's so well cast in this too he really is it's not like they just gave him a part because he's Camille they like that were like, you are right for this part. And he fucking nails it. And like you said, too, about the speech at the end where it's like, oh, but I got a whole thing. And they're like, oh, gives a fuck. Like, I don't care about that. That's not what the vibe here is. Yeah, you're, you're fine. You already finished it. We don't need you to do the whole thing. And because the episode was filmed over a super hot week in Vancouver, Morgan said, nobody had any fun filming this episode except for Camille. He had so much fun that he made up for everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> Which like, I I totally get that. If you get the opportunity to be on your favorite show of all time, like, put me in the hottest costume you have. I will do literally <laughs> fucking anything. I don't give a shit. I'm so happy to be here. And you can just feel that in his energy, too. Like, yeah. he just nails every piece of this performance. So I just wanted to talk specifically about what a great job he Kamel did. Kamel is great. He's I've been a fan of his for a really long time. I used to listen to The Indoor Kids, which is a video game podcast that he used to do. I don't know. I'm not even a big gamer, but I just, I really liked because he used to do it with his wife, and I just liked their joy about things, mm-hmm. and I liked listening to people talk about things that they really, really like, yeah. especially a thing that I'm not particularly into. And I like that in his p- performances, even when he does serious things, you can tell that Kumail is like happy and committed and like... I'm so happy that that dude's career is taking off because he's fucking great. Yep. And his wife's great, too. Like, they're both great. I like when great thi- great people get good things. Yeah, I totally agree. The creepy hotel manager is Mr. Fingers from Jose Chung. He's one of the hypnotherapists. And so it was delightful to record the last episode and watch this and then immediately see him yeah. come back as, like... Drinking rubbing alcohol. The complete opposite of the character that he played before. So I really enjoyed that. I thought that he did a really good job. It was, like, really well cast in this part. So he's, like, shaking and drinking the rubbing alcohol. I just thought that those were really good details. And then the reception was completely positive for this episode. There's a lot of very... Uh, critical responses to season 10 as a whole a lot of people felt like why are we doing this why are we bringing this back but then when they got to this episode people were like this is why this is why we're bringing it back this is what we want to see from Mulder and Scully as middle-aged men and women they are still who they are and this episode just fully absolutely nails that which I really really like so it's just super good also it has a hundred percent rating on Rotten Tomatoes which is like it speaks to how well this episode was conceived, constructed, and then ultimately delivered on. It's just a fucking great episode. I think that this is in my top 25. Like, it's just fucking great. It's just a a top 25. There's over 200 episodes. There's a shitload of episodes. It's just funny to me. It's just who I am. It's time to show down. Sure. All right. 
Mulder and Scully are back on the X-Files, but Mulder is having a crisis of personality. Could these murders really be a lizard monster? Well, turns out, no, it's just a regular serial killer. But the were-lizard is real and teaches Mulder to love himself and monsters again. Also, Scully's tits look incredible in this. (laughs) They do. They really do. (laughs) A middle-aged Mulder finds something to renew his belief in the unusual and unexplained in an ancient kiwi reptile, I mean primordial being. Oh, also, capitalism is bad and Scully got a new dog. Good. (laughs) <laughs> Ready for Deep Throat's mission logs? Let's do it. Shall I tell you what human companionship means to me? A struggle. A defense against the emotions of others. At times, the emotions burst in on me. Hatred, desire, envy, pity. Pity is the worst of all. Now, I agree with the Vulcans. Violent emotion is a kind of insanity. Starting with, is there... In truth, no beauty. <laughs> is there, in truth, no beauty? <laughs> Son of a bitch. It's quite the title. <laughs> so it is from a 17th century English poet and clergyman, George Herbert, from his poem, ah. Jordan 1, line 2, who says that fictions only and false hair become a verse. Is there, in truth, no beauty? What the fuck does that mean? <laughs> I don't fucking know. (laughs) Or care. (laughs) Or care. (laughs) This was directed. But you remember it was written by a librarian. This fucking nerd. That's true. That's true. That is a librarian poll. Absolutely. That is a hardcore librarian poll. Yeah. This was directed by noted fisheye lens lover Ralph (laughs) Saninsky and written by Gene Lizetta Roast originally and then punched up by Gene Roddenberry and Arthur H. Singer, of course. Stell mentioned earlier that originally another actress was up for the part of Dr. Jones. That actress was Jessica Walter. What? <laughs> oh, shit. She was busy. She'd be busy. I can't see why. Yeah. Would have been a different vibe. Yeah, would have. Real difference. We noted Scotty's fetching ass tartan in this. He wears it again in the Savage Curtain, except that time he wears the red socks instead of the white ones. Oh, but okay. looks very, very smashing in it. He's so good. Yep. The remastered version of this episode replaces the Medusan homeworld effect with that of a newly designed Medusan vessel. So we saw the redesigned one. So you see the little Medusan vessel traveling yes. along the Enterprise instead of like just a planet as their home planet. That model for that Medusan vessel was actually one of the early models for the USS Enterprise made by director Matt Jeffries. So... They look completely different. Hate it. Don't want that. (laughs) Hate it. Dislike. Great redesign. It was great. Uh, We've talked a bit here and there, more in season one, about Lieutenant Leslie, one of the regular background characters for this show, being played by Eddie Paskey. This was his last appearance in the series, season three, so he almost made it all the way. Pretty late in season three, too, I think. However, he dipped out because in that wonderful fight with Spock in the fisheye lens, throwing everyone out of the way, the first cut of it... Lieutenant Leslie is in it, and Eddie Paskey hurt his back, (laughs) taking a bump in that fight. That plus being under bright theater set lights for years, giving him headaches, he just decided to step out and leave the show after this. He's out. Actually, it's early in season three. I was wrong. But still, season three, he made it. Season three, yeah. (laughs) Moving on to some casting stuff, which we don't actually have a lot of. We already talked about Diana Muldar in our previous episode, Return to Tomorrow, if you want to know. More it's about the body her. swap again episode. Go in and listen to that. If you haven't listened to that, I don't know why are you here. Uh, you I, can listen to these out of order. Okay, yeah, you can totally listen right, to these yeah. out of order. Do whatever you want. Put us on shuffle. As long Live as your you own listen. <laughs> there is in passing a notable female science crew person in quarter group A who was a black woman. Mm-hmm. That is Frida Renty. She was born on December 29th, nineteen thirty-two, in Chicago, Illinois. Hey! She's sis- she's uh, sister to actress and comedian Marla Gibbs, who did 227 and a bunch of soap operas. She also has a long list of uncredited walk-on roles, including on other Desilu productions. So she's just around. Hey, if you can make money as an extra, do it. Uh, for real. Oh, gosh, yes. They have a great union, too. Yeah. I hope they did back then. <laughs> <laughs> Which brings us to the only guest actor other than Diana Moldar. Larry. That is David Frankham as Larry, <laughs> Larry Maverick. Larry. Starting in 56 with the matinee theater TV series and guest roles on Maverick and Men Into Space. He also voiced Sergeant Tibbs in 101 Dalmatians in 1961. Uh, oh. 
when Dave Frankum guest starred on The Outer Limits, his episode is Don't Open Till Doomsday, his character in that show was also the victim of an alien hidden in a box, which injured those who looked at it. You got <laughs> a niche. Casting. You got a fucking niche. Go I with mean, it. I mean, he does a good job in this episode. He is very unlikable. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, right away, you don't like him. And his madness yeah. is like the when he's like, oh, oh, you love me. You hate me. Oh, and he's all sweaty and stuff. Like, he does a good job. It's poignantly mm-hmm. over the top. Yeah. yeah. Yes. He also has returned guest roles on Gomer Pyle and Beverly Hillbillies and movie roles in The Great Santini, Wrong is Right, Master of the World, and Edgar Allan Poe's Tales of Terror. He's still alive, but he's notably retired and living in Santa Fe, New Mexico. So, like... Hell yeah. Have a good life. I love it when actors retire. I, I always I'm make it a point this. when I see it on IMDb that it says like retired and is now living as like a whatever. I always write it down because I think it's great. I love it. It's like you really lived your best life. You had a real career that you could retire from. As an actor, if you can retire, fucking good for you, dude. <laughs> <laughs> actually no i'm done bye yeah don't like, call me i made the decision to stop doing this like yes. i love that <laughs> we'll move on to Mulder and scully meet the Were monster of course directed by darren morgan written by chris carter and darren morgan no one else could have done something like this no absolutely not According to Gillian Anderson, those drawings that you see of the were lizard monster that they're putting around the whole time, those were drawn by her daughter, Piper. Really? Aww. That's sweet. <laughs> yeah. And it is a Darren Morgan episode. Everything is a reference. Starting notably with the outfit worn by Reese Darby in this episode. Aaron, you mentioned earlier Night Stalker, which mm-hmm. was the other show that this was originally a spec script for. That was supposed to be a reboot of Kolchek the Night Stalker, a show that we've referenced a bunch here on this show yeah. and another early spooky sci-fi show. That outfit that Reese Darby wears is identical to the outfit Kolchek the Night Stalker wears. Mm. So that's the reference there. And that's why I think this might have worked as a Kolchek script, depending on the mood that they were going with the reboot but it is better with all of steeped in all of the x-files yeah. once they punch it up with the rest of the x-files stuff it yeah just look looks so well. oh wow it is yeah. the exact holy outfit. shit that is the exact outfit yeah, that's cool i like that reference uh, as <laughs> as Stella alluded to earlier the tombstones in the cemetery have names jack hardy and kim manners jack was the assistant director for the x-files i want to believe kim was an x-files director producer and someone we've talked a bunch about on this show and supernatural and supernatural as well <laughs> The dates of birth and deaths are correct on Kim's tombstone, and the quote, which Aaron mentioned, let's kick it in the ass, is one of his favorite phrases. There's also a headstone with the name Jerry Harden on it. Jerry Harden played Ronald Palooka, a.k.a. Deep Throat, in early seasons. So, Aww. it's Big Ron's tomb. Big Ron? <laughs> in out. Oregon, for some reason. <laughs> More into the Darren Morgan reference-a-thon, there's Charles Fort that Mulder mentions in his rant in the beginning of the episode of, he wrote four books that I have them all memorized. I have them memorized. (laughs) Fort is notable for, yes, being a person who thought a lot about and wrote a lot about researching phenomena like that. However, he's also notable for, like, often completely tapping out destroying all of his notes and like taking a step back like Mulder is doing this episode. However, he always started again, (laughs) started writing again, started contacting Mm. with people again, but he's a highly influential figure in researching anomalous phenomena. There are several references to earlier Darren Morgan X-Files episodes. We hear about Dagu in this episode, Scully's new dog. Of course, Scully's earlier dog, Queequeg, I remember. Dead. Uh, both are... Dead. <laughs> quick, quick, dead. Both are Moby Dick reference. Another book that Star Trek loves to reference. Oh, yeah. Unsurprising. And then, of course, referencing Dana Scully being immortal, which comes from Clyde Brockwood's yes. final report. Even I knew that. Mm-hmm. Yep, because we talked about it. Oh, I pay attention. <laughs> Very good at my job. <laughs> Reese Darby, who, again, loved being in this episode. God do you know how hard it is to suppress comedians from riffing? And for him to say that like the script was perfect and he didn't need to add shit. Huge, huge, huge. Yeah. But he also injured his finger in that graveyard fight scene. He cut himself with the fake glass and he needed two (laughs) stitches on his finger. (laughs) I'm going to kill you. (laughs) More Darren Morgan deep cuts. Morgan wanted Scully to wear a New York Knicks t-shirt in that hotel room scene where Scully says Mulder's back crap crazy to insinuate that it is Mulder's t-shirt, even though they aren't together. The t-shirt that she's wearing is still supposed to be a reference to that. So 
I think that's very cute. We talked briefly about the trans representation in this episode and how it's pretty good, but also misses the mark yeah. in a lot of ways that are timed and dated. David Duchovny notably plays a trans character in Twin Peaks, and that representation also kind of has that double-edged sword of, of this time being really, really good, yeah. but dated horribly. And so that's also thought of as a reference to that as well. Oh, wait, I just want to interject. One of the other Easter eggs inside of that fight scene is that Mulder immediately loses his gun. That's something that happened yeah. over oh, and God, over yes. and over. Not the gun. This, not the gun, you fool. And then just like immediately loses it. And like Mulder references it in some episodes too, where he's like, oh, well, I always got a spare because I lose my gun all the time. Well, even earlier in the episode, Mulder says, oh, well, if that monster looks like the drawing, I want a picture of it. And Scully says, if that monster looks like the drawing, I'm emptying my whole clip into it. Yeah, yeah. So which is still a very Scully. I, yeah, I even made a note character. of it. I was like, Mulder, use the camera and she uses the gun. gun. Yep. It's, <laughs> it's still right there. It's still perfect. Yep. So moving on to casting stuff. Yes, that is Alex Diacoon as manager. Up until this point, all of Alex Diacoon's episode have been in Darren Morgan episodes. So Canadian actors getting work. The actual where Lizard is not played by Reese Darby. It's actually played by Ryan Beale, who's a Canadian actor and comedian. Before this, he plays the set guy in the season six, episode six, episode of Supernatural, The French Mistake. That's a good episode. Do they do anything with the Blazing Saddles reference? Because that's the title. Let me refresh my memory. Because oh, look, I've watched like well, 11 that's, seasons. That's my fault. Uh, <laughs> also has done a bunch of TV and short films. After this, he does voices on Bob the Builder, Chuck's Choice, Littlest Pet Shop, My Little Pony Friendship is Magic is Zephyr Breeze, and is also on iZombie and the Are You Afraid of the Dark reboot in live action flicks. Oh, so the French Mistake episode is the one where they're sent to a parallel universe where they are... Jensen Ackles and Jared Padalecki filming Supernatural, and they're like, "Wait, wait, what the fuck?" And everybody's like, "Like Misha Collins plays Misha Collins and is terminally online and is like hanging out with Jared and Jensen." <laughs> and they're like, "Oh, what kind of name is Jensen? What kind of name is Misha?" And then they like, it's just a ref, a self referential thing. Interesting. Interesting. It's a pretty good episode. It is annoyingly meta, but it's also pretty good. I mean, we're here talking about this right now. Yeah. That is Richard Newman as the charming Dr. Romanovich, the psychiatrist who is very pill happy. The witch doctor. The witch doctor. Born on November 2nd, 1946 in Chicago, Illinois. Hey! And also, are you ready for a long list? A hugely prominent voice actor. I love voice acting. <laughs> Camp Candy, Video Power, Toad Borg on Bucky O'Hare, Set on Conan the Adventure, Exo Squad, Kale on Ronin Warriors, Mobile Suit Gundam, Escaflone, M. Bison in the Street Fighter animated series, Rhinox on Beast Wars and Beast Machines, The High Evolutionary in Spider-Man Unlimited, Oolong and Captain fucking Ginyu in Dragon Ball Z, X-Men Evolution, Masters of the Universe, Totsai and Inuyasha, Johnny Quest, Cranky Doodle Donkey on My Little Pony Friendship <laughs> is Magic. God. As well as guest starring and recurring roles on live television like Marty on the Commish. So, surprise, he's cool as heck. <laughs> he was very funny. Yes. He was really well cast in that part. As we mentioned earlier, that is DJ Pierce, who is Shangela as Annabelle, the Daenerys Targaryen of drag. <laughs> Performing as Shangela, she completed in three separate seasons of RuPaul's Drag Race. Shangela is drag daughter of Alyssa Edwards, who is also on season five and All-Stars 2 on Drag Race. She's had roles in Community, Terriers, Super Drags, and recently in Lovecraft Country as Lena fucking Horn. Shangela's like a great drag queen and is really fun and has done a lot of positive stuff outside of Drag Race because Drag Race can be a very toxic. I mean, I stopped watching it because I was like, this is not fun anymore. This is very toxic. But Shangela is super talented and is definitely like a positive thing that's come out of that and is a good actor. And I'm glad that mm -hmm. they are getting recognized as like being a good actor yes. in both drag and out of drag. Mm -hmm. Aaron mentioned earlier our two stoners, Nicole Parker and Tyler Levine, Nicole Parker Smith as stoner chick. She also did an episode of Millennium. And then her other major role was in the live action Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, The Next Mutation. She's Venus de Milo, you know, the female turtle. <laughs> There's a female turtle? Yeah. I never really watched it. Just Ninja breasts Turtles. and everything. I have to look it up. I'm serious. <laughs> I know. You can't keep going. I mean, no, I'm going to stop and wait till you see this turtle. <laughs> oh, no. Uh huh. Oh, no. Uh huh. <laughs> I hate it. Yeah. Imagine that walking and talking to you. 
Uh. Oh, that's... I don't like that. I don't like that at all. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, good for her for getting work, but also like... I mean, it's um, nice that there was a lady turtle, but also like... Yeah. <laughs> representation but not like this breasts there's some good like fan art of her but yep. like the actual what about the female turtle <laughs> remembering venus de Milo. <laughs> oh, the internet's a great place for me <laughs> <It's> a- <laughs> cloacas anyways <laughs> and that is tyler labine as our stoner number two of course tyler is a heavy sought after canadian character actor for all your quirky sci-fi and horror dudes Breaker High, Action Man, Dark Angel, Dead Last, Invasion, several episodes of Boston Legal, of course, Reaper, movies like Zack and Mary Make a Porno, Tucker and Dale vs. Evil, a good old-fashioned orgy, Rise of the Planet of the Apes. He's around and he's going to be around. Most recently, he voiced Hunk on Voltron Legacy Defender. So, seems like a good enough dude. Prolific. I don't know. Yeah, prolific. definitely prolific. That is Reese Darby, of course, as Guy Man, a New Zealand comedian that gained notoriety with Flight of the Concords, How to Be a Gentleman, and What We Do in the Shadows, the film. He's also Shark Fighter on the Aquabat Super Show. So uh, he's Shark Fighter. He fights sharks. He <laughs> fights them in the water. You can tell when you get really nerdy about something because your voice changes cadence. Mm-hmm. <laughs> gets higher. And His like, only Please. goal is a shark casserole. His only creed is to make sharks bleed. Anyways. <laughs> 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 After that, he was absolutely everywhere, and he is still absolutely everywhere. He recently voiced Hypnopotamus on the rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles show. And Did that Neil- one have tits? I don't know, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and Neil the Eel on Carbon San Diego. Aww. Which is a great cartoon. The Carbon San Diego reboot is really good. Yeah. And then, yes, that is Camille Nanjiani as Pasha. Aaron talked about his X-Files cred, but he also gained fame and notoriety in Michael and Michael F. Issues, The Meltdown, Drunk History, Burning Love, Franklin and Bash, voicing Prismo on Adventure Time, He's Portlandia. Great in Adventure Time. Silicon Valley Prismo is one of my favorite characters yeah, in Prismo's Adventure Time. Prismo's great. And he's about to be Kingo in Marvel's Eternals, which I hope is good. I'll go see it, but I have no, like, it looks boring. Yeah. Yeah, I hope they do okay with it. It's just going to be Organians being like, we're around and we don't want to fuck around with things, but now we have to. Ugh. That is actually pretty much it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's, that's what it is. Yeah. We're so powerful. We like don't care. Uh, your affairs are disgusting to us. <laughs> Angelina Jolie. <laughs> Anyways, that's all that's in my throat this week. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that. Oh, Jesus. Uh, evolution of a podcast. <laughs> now for our overall thoughts. Ooh. You know, there was a recent comparative cognition study that showed that dogs hold hostilities toward people that harm their masters. Well, I guess maybe I miss having a dog to love and someone to hold my grudges for me. These episodes tied together in that they are very much about toxic masculinity <laughs> in lots of ways, which is also about loneliness, as we've talked about earlier in this episode. Like... There are lots of good things about both of these episodes. They're both, just to spoil the sec- the questions coming up, they're both fucks. Like, I mean, we all know that that's what's coming for these ratings. Like, these are both very well done, very well thought out episodes that have a lot of detail and planning inside I mean, of them. I think that's a, a way that these really tie together, too, is that they're, like, written by two people who are good at crafting a world and putting in, like, like the librarian put in all of these like references and was inspired by things to create this like sci-fi world and then Darren Morgan loves a reference and creates like a whole like world within a world especially because like for season three Star Trek's already established for season 10 X-Files is super established so to do something new is impressive and I think both Mm -hmm. of the writers are really really good and also like we stand librarians (laughs) yes we stand librarians we stand Darren Morgan really great really great really great (laughs) and they're both like I mean to to put like a fine point on that too they're both written by people who love these shows yes which is evident which you can tell yeah absolutely it's completely evident in the writing and the way that they've been crafted so casual fan questionnaire as a casual fan would you recommend this episode to a newbie yeah, I think I would. It's really good. And like you said, it doesn't seem like one that people really talk about all that much. It's like a great Star Trek episode, but it really fucking is. Yeah. I feel like the the hardest thing about it is that they're very toxic at the beginning. Yeah. And so you kind of have to, I wouldn't say this is the first episode you should watch, but if you've seen two, three episodes and are like familiar with the characters, I think that you could drop in on this episode. And I think it would make you continue watching the show. Yeah, I don't think they 
I don't think the triumvirate necessarily act out of character. They just are acting on their worst impulses. Yes. Which is part of the reason why this episode works for me, because I don't think anybody is being out of character. Like, Bones is like a, a old perv, and Spock is a petty, jealous bitch, and Kirk yes. is a shameless flirt. Like, But yeah. they are just acting on them in inappropriate ways, and they have to come to terms with like, oh, fuck. Yes. Maybe I should chill a little. Yeah, I totally agree. Would you recommend this episode to a newbie? I think yes, with the caveat of like, you have to understand that this is an episode that is very late in the series. Mm -hmm. And like, I think you could find enjoyment out of this just based on like, with baseline pop culture knowledge of like Mulder and Scully. But I feel like you would get more enjoyment from this if you watched earlier seasons. I don't think it would turn anybody off. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if it's one you just want to jump into. Yeah. It feels like one you could watch and then be like, I have a lot of questions, so I'm going to watch some more of this. Yeah. I don't know. that I would never pick this as like the hook because yeah, no way. they're middle-aged and you really need <laughs> the like Mulder has gone through it. And I love too that Scully says in this episode, you're clearly going through it. And it's because it's very meta. It's one of those things where it's like, yeah, you can drop in, but you'll have way more enjoyment if you understand the meta nature of it. What is the scene from this episode that you won't forget? The loneliness speech. The this It's amazing to have senses, but language is so limited. And the feeling of being alone is makes me not want to be in this body anymore. Which, again, I think ties into toxic masculinity. But it's just a really great observation about humanity. Yeah. That, like, we are very alone. And you have to make the choice to make connection. What about you? Which which scene's <laughs> gonna stick with you from this? Honestly, I think the final scene with Kumail, the like him trying to do his serial killer thing. A, because I think that's such a good encapsulation of the show. It's like that's not what the show is about. We don't care about serial killers and normal shit. Yes. But also just because like I have been personally watching a lot of like media about serial killers and stuff where they're treated very preciously, and to have it be like no, uninteresting. Get out of here. You killed animals, of course. Duh. That's like serial killer one one. Get out of my face. Yep. It's like <laughs> so funny to me. I also like that in the scene too. Scully's like, "I'm sorry, it's not a monster. It's just a regular old serial killer." And then you also get, "But the monster's real." Yes. Like I think putting those two things and stitching them together is a really smart move on Darren Morgan's. Surprise, Darren Morgan. Did a really smart thing with the writing. He's so good at his job. <laughs> you shipping anybody in this episode? Spones. <laughs> I just love it's your default. I, I mean, I do default. It's a triumphant episode. I like that they they all care about Spock being returned to how he was, and like that's very important to them, and their relationships with each other are very important. But I just love that, like. That's not Spock. That's not my boyfriend. And then, oh, you don't think that I know Lord Byron? Oh, that's Spock. There he is. Big old grin. Like, of course I'm shipping that. How can I not? <laughs> is this a fuck fine or a flop? Well, you didn't ask me about my ship. Oh, I'm sorry. Who's your ship from this episode? I think this is very interesting because like two episodes ago or three episodes ago or whatever, I was like, oh, I'm finally shipping them. I get this. I do feel this episode of, like, we've been there. Yeah. We love each other, but we already fucked. <laughs> We're done with this. And I feel like you ha that this episode does have, like, middle-aged married couple vibe, yes, which is very great. much so. <laughs> yes, 100%. I totally agree with that. That, like, I'm going to talk at you, and I'm just going to allow you to do this. And, yeah. like, oh, that's the Mulder I care about. <laughs> it's so nice. Once it again, nice. proving that in absence of one Walter Skinner, Stella will ship Mulder yeah. and Scully. Yeah, this is bullshit. This is, like, episode six out of 20. If I don't get some Skinner soon, I'm going to scream. You're going to flip the table. I quit. Yeah, I'm going to destroy a cell phone store. Bring me daddy. <laughs> Is this a fuck fine or a flop? It's a fuck. Yeah, this is a fuck. These are both fucks. I love that you... I was really worried that you weren't going to like Is There In Truth No Beauty? <laughs> because again, I just really like this episode and nobody talks about it. I'm really excited to show you All Our Yesterdays, which is the other episode that she wrote that's also an unappreciated banger and is really a Spones episode. I'm excited yeah. for you to watch that I'm one. I'm so excited. More love for season three eps. I'm into it. I, just, I mean, I'm a fan. I like I like TOS. It's Yay! a great show. It's a really good show. 
All right. You can find us on the internet. You can follow us at NYD Productions on Twitter, and you can interact with the show using the hashtag Pod. You can find me at NYD Urgency on Instagram. You can find me on Twitter at Sella underscore Cheeks. And you can find me on Twitter at Hubbard Asher 9K, I guess, if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> you can also email us at extrexpod at gmail.com with questions or comments. Big swerve here. So I have several links where Skinner and Mulder are like, but we can't fuck because we're men, and then they fuck. So if you want that, I have them. Look, a lot of X Files fic was written in like the nineties, and like, yeah. And Skinner is big and tough, and he's like, oh, I don't know. And then they're like, oh, toxic masculinity, or do you want to kiss? And they're like, we should probably we should just kiss. kiss. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want, oh. oh, I'm so happy. <laughs> we really have like, you're here now. You're in this. You're recommending <laughs> Skinner fix. You're recommending. Oh, I mean, I don't make the joke a lot, but I have a lot of Skinner links. If you want them. I've done like deep dives off of like into like old like X-Files only fic websites that are like coded in like black and red and like are not tagged and are, you know, they're intense. But I've been there. I'm in a deep. I'm really curious about when we get to an episode where you go, oh, my God, I know this from a fic. Like that's going to happen. Oh, it's definitely happened because there are things I've read where they clearly reference it or they'll tag like season nine episode whatever. And I'm like, I don't know what happens in this, but I don't care. I just want them to get <laughs> I wonder if I've spoiled anything for myself. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, almost certainly. (laughs) Speaking of all these links and where you can find them, we've launched an NYD Productions Discord that has its own channel for Stella's Link Lounge (laughs) that she can freely drop any of these in. You can get access to that as well as stuff like behind the scenes action, like script notes, outtakes, extra podcasts, like unofficial channels, all on our Patreon at patreon.com slash NYD Productions, and all only for a dollar. And don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and to tell your friends. We find that this nerdy shit is better when it's shared. We'll see you next episode for the animals episode. Gorn, 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 (laughs) Gorn, Gorn. Aaron was like, when do we get to see the Gorn? Because I have a Gorn versus Kirk poster where we watched the X-Files. And I was like, I don't don't know. Like, we'll get to it eventually. It's next time. It's next. All right. Fantastic. Aaron, what's the X-Files episode for that one? It could be so many different things for the X-Files. I ruined our our flow. Oh, I don't care. (laughs) That was a joke. (laughs) In the meantime. Believe boldly. Seek truth. Ship proudly. Extrex is created and written by Stella Cheeks, Aaron Klein, and Bobby Hoffman, and produced by Bobby Hoffman for NYD Productions. Our show theme is Alien Spy by Ionix, and our show art was made by Jonathan Curtis. Scotty, where are we? I don't know. Beyond the boundaries of the galaxy. We made it. We're safe. We're safe, Captain Kirk. Oh. No. No! No, Captain, we mustn't sleep. No! No! No, they come in your dreams. That's the worst. They suffocate in your dreams. No! no. All right, all right, all right. No. We'll take you to a place to hide, a no. better place. Come no. on, come on. No, we're going to stay on. here with the controls. All right. Ready to speed. Speed. Speed to the next galaxy. You're bat crap crazy.